Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry for the inconvenience. Once again, sir. Uh, everybody is there now. You are uh, for YouTube live, so. Right. So should I start from the beginning or uh, in between? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, it would be good if we could start from the beginning. Right. Okay. Sorry for the inconvenience. Hey, no problem. Again. Don't say sorry and all that. I understand. See, good afternoon to all of you. We are picking up on to FR, and uh, there was some technical problem. We are starting by. 2.15 and uh, we are having 35 NDAs and a few miscellaneous topics that we do have and we will be handling it on 1st of April to 5th of April, first five days and then next four days, 15th of April to 18th of April, four days between two to six and totally nine days and each day of four hours, approximately 36 hours of class we will be having. Even those who have just started their uh, preparation at this moment, definitely we will be in a position to make a very good impact on our preparation and score very good marks. And uh, NDAS is nothing but the Indian version of IFRS. The old IFRS series will have from one number one to 41. Don't count 41 totally you have, it is not like that. We do not have uh, many accounting standards in between. So therefore, some accounting standards not there, but you do have majority into it. And from 101 to 116, you do have accounting standards, but some of them are not there in the syllabus. So totally old and the new put together, you are having 35 NDAs. And we do have miscellaneous topics that we will be taking up in between. And of all that, we would like to take up on to NDAS 23 borrowing cost and we have assigned 45 minutes time from now on. So when we tell about borrowing cost, we need to know that borrowing cost should be, there should be a borrowing, there should be a cost associated with that and that should be related to one qualifying assets or qualified assets. 
and when is that we are uh, or what is it we are expected to do with this borrowing cost borrowing cost generally when it is incurred for the creation of qualified assets we are expected to capitalize for some period of time and then we are expected to expense it so we all know asset is created we all know that asset is created and it takes substantial period of time so it takes time to complete when it takes time to complete with the borrowings also taken up definitely interest is going to be the borrowing cost so what and all will be included under borrowing cost we will have as a separate discussion so i will give you a overall message to you and since it is a rapid revision or i would just say a fast track we will not be in a position to go into greater details but very important ones will be taken up for discussion so asset will be there and it will take time to complete before it is put for its intended use and such asset should be having borrowing and they should have incurred interest and the asset creation should not be suspended so you should have borrowing and borrowing cost should be incurred with that borrowing you should have created an asset and uh, that interest will be taken for capitalization this is what you do have this is what you do have so please understand that one moment So we understand that there will be an asset and a time to complete and there will be a borrowing and interest will be there interest should not be taken for expensing that should be taken for capitalization so in case the active development is suspended then interest is not expected to be capitalized and that is to be expensed so there are only two treatments that you have as far as borrowing costs of concern and borrowings are to be classified into two specific borrowing and general borrowing right so as far as specific borrowing is concerned there is a particular treatment that you have for general borrowing we have another treatment we have so specific borrowing where the borrowing cost actual borrowing cost shall be capitalized borrowing cost shall be capitalized so sometimes what will happen is that uh, the companies would have drawn the money completely and they would have used a part of that borrowing for development purposes the remaining amount uh, drawn they will not be keeping it idle and they will be putting it out in some investments such investments are expected to be generating some amount of income and uh, we are expected to deduct that amount of income from the borrowing cost so therefore i will put the term as net borrowing cost net would mean the entire borrowing cost as reduced by income generated from the investments such investments were made out of that borrowing it is not that interest on income where such investment was made out of uh, some other funds it is not like that so let me put it like this way as the borrowing and uh, if you find that 70 lakhs used for that creation of as an asset and 30 lakhs kept as a temporary investment and uh, interest will be charged on entire 100 lakhs the banker may not know how much of that is used for the asset creation and how much you have put them for investments so whereas he will be charging for 100 lakhs 
it may not be fair to load when you have spent only 70 lakhs in the creation of the asset and uh, therefore accounting standard is very clear about that you take up the entire borrowing cost but deduct the interest or the income that is generated out of the investments and the net amount only is expected to be capitalized so therefore you would be having interest cost on 100 lakhs as reduced by income generated out of this 30 lakhs and thereby automatically you would be capitalizing only to the extent of 70 lakhs this is what uh, you have as uh, a general understanding with respect to specific borrowing in case of general borrowing then what is that we are expected to do so we are expected to take up capitalization rate so capitalization rate uh, is expected to be a weighted capitalization rate that we have got to do what is that total borrowing cost total borrowing cost uh, minus specific borrowing cost thereby what you get is general borrowing cost divided by total borrowings minus specific borrowing so this will help you to find out uh, the capitalization rate and uh, the amount to be capitalized would be capitalization rate multiplied by amount spent on capital asset creation on capital asset creation but what will happen is that the capitalization rate that you work out uh, might be approximated because you don't get a whole number figures when you express that in terms of percentage so there will always be a tendency that 17.72 percentage people may round it off to say 18 percentage or 17.8 percentage or such percentages when they take it up to the next number there will always be a chance that the capitalization or the capitalized amount might uh, uh, be a little greater than the actual borrowing cost so where uh, they are uh, very clear about uh, we are not expected to take up some notional items for the purpose of capitalization so this the in this particular case they do not put any cap because actual borrowing cost alone is taken up for capitalization whereas against a general borrowing when you have a capitalization rate and such capitalization rate when it is used there will always be a chance that people might round it off and this might result into a scenario where the capitalized borrowing cost might even be greater than actual borrowing cost so in order to prevent that uh, sort of notional items getting capitalized they have put a cap what is that put they have put a cap so such a capitalized value should not be exceeding the actual borrowing cost so this is the only aspect that we have got to be very careful with and other than that i find there is no problem at all so this and uh, we are expected to bring about uh, disclosure of what is a capitalization rate how much you have capitalized during the period what is that you consider as a substantial period of uh, time for the purpose of identifying the asset as a qualifying asset so here i am just telling it out as a qualified asset or you can put it out as a qualifying assets so those assets which are expected to take up a longer period of time for making it uh, ready for its intended use you call it as qualifying asset otherwise they are not qualifying asset at all so once the asset is ready for its intended use so such of those assets after that particular period will not be qualified assets but the borrowing will continue to be there and borrowing cost will continue to be incurred so once that period uh, once that particular purpose or once that development period is getting over then the borrowing cost will continue to be incurred that will not be taken for capitalization so capitalization shall be done only during the period of development and if uh, the development is suspended for some valid reasons then borrowing cost will also be suspended sometimes what will happen is that when the development process is suspended as a part of development then borrowing cost will not be taken for suspension say what is it see when i am constructing a building once that ceiling is over 
I cannot be taking up the construction the next day. So, the concrete, uh, when it is in a semi-solid state at which then they are putting it out and uh, it will get concretized and uh, it will become a hardened stuff. But within few hours, it will become a hardened stuff. But as per uh, the technical confirmation and the compliances, so they require uh, two weeks to three weeks to solidify very hard to take up to the next floor. So therefore, you would always be finding in all these places of construction, no activity will be carried out uh, for a period of three weeks to four weeks. So when that sort of suspension is considered to be part of the development process, you should not misunderstand that they have suspended the work and therefore capitalization process should be suspended. That sort of conclusion we should not be making. If you have the opportunity to develop and where it is suspended for some other reason, then you are expected to suspend. So when the suspension is part of the development process, so your uh, capitalization process will not be suspended. So you have to be very careful with that. And uh, I, I think uh, at this stage for AS23, this much of introduction is sufficient. Now we would like to take up on to uh, a problem which I have just given to SARC and let me just share that. One moment. I hope that this uh, we do have this uh, India's questions given to you, and uh, let me just take up on to this borrowing cost. So, question number two, let me just read out. Question number two, K Limited began construction of a new building at an estimated cost of 7 lakhs on 1st of April X1. To finance construction of the building, it obtained a specific loan of 2 lakhs from the financial institution at an interest rate of 9% per annum. The company's outstanding loan were 700,000. 900,000 and the rates of interest being 12% and 11%. Expenditure incurred on the construction on April and August 150,000 and 200,000. October and January 350,000 and 100,000. The construction of the building was completed by 31st of January X2. Following the provisions of India's 23 borrowing cost, uh, borrowing cost calculate the amount of interest to be capitalized and pass necessary journal entry for capitalizing the cost and borrowing cost in respect of building as on 31st of January X2. So here is a place where uh, a new building is expected to cost 7 lakhs on 1st of April. They have taken a specific loan to the extent of 2 lakhs from a financial institution at the rate of 9% and the remaining 5 lakhs they have got to take it up from other borrowings which would cost them 12% and 11%. Right. And uh, expenditure that they have incurred at various points of time that they have given, we are asked to find out how much of that total borrowing cost will be capitalized and what journal entry we would be passing, right. So shall we start the work? So please just understand when they have specifically taken a loan for construction of the new building to the extent of 2 lakhs at the rate of 9 percentage for how many months that we are expected to take up. So from 
first of April X1 2. What is the date on which the work got over? The work got over on 31st of January X2. So, 31st of January X2. How many months? How many months of interest? April to December 9 months. January, one more month. So, 10 months. Now, let us just know about how much is that we are expected to take up. 2 lakhs into 0 0.09 into 10 divided by 12. So, a sum of 15,000 has got to be taken for capitalization under the head of specific borrowing. Then, when it comes for Are you in a position to, one moment, I, I, I just don't see, my camera is showing any. Let me just check up. Yeah. So nobody had pointed out that uh, there was a problem there. Yes. So we are expected to take into consideration 15,000 on specific borrowing. As far as general borrowing is concerned, you have 700,000 uh, 700, and 900,000 with 12% and 11%. So we require only 5 lakhs. It becomes a little tight for us to know as from where we have just got this money. So, instead of uh, taking it up at 12 percentage and 11 percentage, so let us just take up the total interest on the total outstanding and find out a weighted average rate and apply it for the remaining 5 lakhs. Okay. So, now let us just try that. So, when it is 7 lakhs into 12 percentage and 9 lakhs into 11 percentage, generally speaking, how much will be the sum that we will be taking up? 700 lakhs into 12 percentage that becomes 84,000 here. Even though it is for 12 months period, just for the sake of finding out weighted average rate of interest, we are taking it up. Then 9 lakhs into 11 percentage that comes to 99,000. So 84,000 plus 94,000 that will work out to 183,000 and the capitalization rate will be 183 thousands divided by 16 lakhs when you take it up. Let us know about what is the percentage that it comes. Rajagwan. So, it is 183 thousands divided by 16 lakhs. It comes to 11.8. Four three seven five percentage, so we may round it off to eleven point four four percentage. Now, for the remaining five lakhs, we shall apply eleven point four four percentage, and only for ten months we will take it up. So five lakhs into point one one four four into ten divided by twelve. 
So something that you capitalize coming under general borrowing will be 47,667. So plus 15,000, so sum to be capitalized will be 62,667. Is it right? See now, let me just repeat once again as how we have just got 11.44 percentage. So we have two borrowings. One, we are taking it up at 12 percentage, the other one at 11 percentage and 183 and all that we will be taking up as the final answer on the assumption that money is spent on 1st of April, right. But look into the problem, but money is not spent at one shot. Money is spent 150,000, say when I am just discussing, I will not be discussing only for that problem. So generally how students would be thinking and how you need to improve all that we should take into consideration. So, if this piece of information regarding expenditure at what point of time they have just given when they have not provided that, then this will be the answer. See, as how you approach a problem, that is what we have to look into. When they have given you the period of expenditure, you have got to be very careful as how you take up for capitalization. So, this figure of 62,667 has got to be taken up as a final answer when they have not provided you the details regarding as what points of time the expenditure that they have incurred. <clears throat> there are very many methods that you have globally as how you have got to take it up. So I will be just trying out one or two and you can take it up in the way that is convenient. See, under examination condition, it is not only one answer that they provide. It is not like a yes or no type where you can have a different ways of convincing the examiner. So if your alternative answers, guideline answers, when you are in a position to do it, you can just try that. See, now let us just take up on 1st of April, 150,000. Even this also they have not mentioned as 1st of April or end of that. See, generally the, the information when it is not provided as by what point of time we will assume. We will assume that it was incurred at the beginning of the period. So you can take it up on 1st of April itself we have just taken taking it up because they have mentioned it as 1st of April. So on 1st of April we shall apply at the rate of because specific loan is taken up to the stage, uh, up to the extent of 2 lakhs. So 150,000 multiplied by 9 percentage for 10 by 12, right. So the one that you can take it up out of 2 lakhs, 1.5 lakhs you spend, the other 50,000 will be taken up from specific borrowing. So where you take up in this particular fashion, where you split that into 50k, 50,000 out of specific borrowing and 150,000 out of general borrowing into 9% into how many months we shall take up from 1st of August to 31st of Jan uh, January, August, September, October, November, December and January. So 6 by 12. And in this particular case, it is 11.44 percentage into 6 by 12, right. Then comes 1st of October, October, November, December, January, 4. This is entirely out of general borrowing 11.44 percentage into 4 by 12. Then this is for only one month, 11.44 percentage into 1 by 12. People might ask this question, sir, how do you know that firstly you should take up for specific borrowing and then for general borrowing? I could easily sense that this could be a very logical question. You are all correct. 
so look into the percentage of a specific loan the rate of interest and for general borrowing so when you have a specific borrowing the rate of interest is nine percentage which one is there is beneficial for the entity to consume the one with having a lower rate of interest so therefore we have taken up is that right so always remember these are the ways through which you take into consideration your computation so the computation part you take care so here i am not there to compute and say this could be the final answer so how do you take up calculate the amount i just discussed past journal entries for capitalization what is the journal entry so in this particular case the concerned asset the asset is property plant and equipment debit ppe and credit shall be given to borrowing cost so borrowing cost they would be paying at various points of time and how much you capitalize will be depending upon how much is the amount that uh, you are calculating in this fashion and this is the way the journal entry is expected to be passed is that clear so with that problem number two is getting over monthly credit post office so are you clear about this one i hope that this point is very clear we have uh, we have just taken up the problem into two different forms what are the two different forms in which we have taken up one assuming that the entire money got spent in first of april itself even though i we have just taken into account uh, in the second part that these amounts were spent at different points of time these are the ways through which you can work it out there can be another way also in global practice people normally take it up for discussion what is that another way of doing things so let me just show that also because students need to be exposed for different sorts of presentation now let me just take up on 1st of april 1st of april 150000 then First of August, two hundred thousand. First of October, three fifty. And first of January, one hundred thousand. initially i have just taken up uh, 2 lakhs here and 5 lakhs in this particular case actually actual amount spent uh, was not 7 lakhs it was only an estimated cost of 7 lakhs even in this particular case uh, we should have just taken it up uh, as 6 lakhs there so let me make that correction there 6 lakhs into 0.1144 into 10 divided by 12 so it comes to Fifty-seven, two hundred plus fifteen thousand. That comes to seventy-two, two hundred. So this is on the assumption that item was spent uh, at the first. There is another way. I was just telling you, no. So this is for ten uh, months. This is for August, September, October, November, December, January. Six months, October four months, and this is for one month. So by twelve, by twelve, by twelve, and by twelve. So let me just bring out one fifty into ten divided by twelve. One twenty-five thousand two hundred into six by twelve. One lakh three fifty into four by twelve. One lakh sixteen thousand six sixty seven. 
1 lakh divided by 12, 8,333. So, if you find a convenience that you get in any of this calculation, you can do. So, you get 350 thousands. So, borrowing cost can be computed in this fashion. This 350 thousands you split into two. You split into two. This 350 thousand as if you, you have spent for all the 12 months period. Specific borrowing 2 lakhs, general borrowing 150 lakhs. So, 2 lakhs into 9 percentage because we have taken the weight for the respective months. So, 2 lakhs into 9 percentage is 18,000 and uh, 1 lakh and 50,000 multiplied by 11.44 percentage. So, that becomes 17,160. So, if you sum up that comes to Eighteen thousand, so it comes to thirty-five thousand one hundred and sixty. Global practices where all these companies used to work out like this, the interest computation. So you got to be very careful in handling it. And uh, if you could convince in your answers, definitely you will be getting full marks. Right. Shall we proceed? So now, in the age 23, in which there will be a portion where you will capitalize, there will be a portion where you will be suspending, you will be expensing. Once they resume the work, it will be taken for capitalization and uh, you will be funding. Once the job is over, then you would be funding that uh, no portion of the borrowing cost will be taken for capitalization it will be expensed. So, at this stage AS in AS 23 is getting over and before I could just proceed to the next one let me tell you that it is not borrowing cost that we take it up only the interest portion but we will also be taking up other than the interest also even the exchange rate fluctuation the exchange translation difference also we will be taking it up as part of borrowing cost so which you find it in the very first problem there question number one abc limited has taken a loan of usd 20000 on 1st of april 20x1 for constructing a plant at an interest rate of 5 percentage per annum payable on annual basis on 1st of april x1 the exchange rate between the currencies usd versus INR was 45 per USD. The exchange rate on the reporting date that is 31st of March X2 is 48 per USD. The corresponding amount could have been borrowed by ABC Limited from State Bank of India in local currency at an interest rate of 11 percentage per annum on 1st of April X1. Compute the borrowing cost to be capitalized. So, it is a equivalent borrowing cost also we we are expected to take up initially the borrowings that we have made is for usd 20000 and uh, when the exchange rate stood at 45000 so how much is the amount of borrowing that we would have made 20000 into 45 how much it comes to 20000 into 45 it comes to 900000 rupees inr so this is the amount of borrowing and uh, the interest rate there for the full year comes to 5 percentage. So, and uh, whatever may be the rate at which you have booked in Indian books, when it was taken US dollars at the end of the year, they would have taken up as 20,000 dollars on which 5 percentage is working out to 1000 dollars, it will become 
21,000 dollars. That point of time, the rate of interest, sorry, the rate of exchange is 48. If you take up 21,000 into 48, that works out to a million and 8,000. Or in Indian way of expressing, it will be 10 lakhs and 8,000. So, the liability at the beginning was 900,000. The liability at the end being 10 lakhs and 8,000. 10 lakhs and 8,000 minus this will come out to 108,000. So, can we take up the entire 108,000 into the books of accounts as borrowing cost for capitalization purposes? So, answer to that question will be in the negative. No, you can't take up the entire difference of 108,000 to be transferred to the asset account. Had you taken up this in INR, how much is the amount of interest that you would have paid on 900,000 at the rate of 11 percentage? Had I taken this loan in INR, that being 900,000, I would have paid only 11 percentage. How much I would have paid interest then? Interest I would have paid to the extent of 99,000. And only to the extent of 99,000 capitalization will be taken up and the remaining 9,000 will be expensed. So, all of you please be careful as part of the borrowing cost, the exchange fluctuation can also be taken up as part of borrowing cost. If such be the case, we are expected to find out what is the maximum amount that you can take it up as borrowing cost and the remaining portion cannot be taken up as borrowing cost. That should be expensed. This is what according standard is saying. So, you have got to be very careful and do not think that uh, for unnecessarily or superfluous information they are given. So, it is not uh, superfluous information. They are very much pertinent information. 11 percentage on the opening borrowing of 900,000 when you take up it comes to 99,000. A yeah, maximum of 99,000 alone can be taken for capitalization and the remaining 9,000 has got to be expensed. So, please be careful. Is that clear? So, with that in the years, 23 years getting over. So, we have just done the basics and in the last problem uh, we had on 6 lakhs So, there is going to be a wide difference 72 200 with uh, the number that we have just uh, taken up that being 35,160 because in that particular case we have assumed that money was spent uh, at the very first uh, stage itself that is on 1st of April. That is the reason as why you had a big difference. So, if you try in this fashion by applying it at various points of time here also we can work out no big deal into this. Now, let me just complete that otherwise our mind will always be getting fixed with that we have not done it. So, this is going to be 11,250 and for 50,000 into 0 0.09 into 6 by 12 this being 2250 and 150,000 into 0 0.1144 into 6 by 12 that comes to 8580. Now, let us just take up for the next two page. 350,000 into 1144 into 4. Sorry. 350,000 into 0.1144 divided by 3. That comes to 13,347 and 100,000 into 0.1144 divided by 12 that comes to 953. Now, let us just take up the totals 11,250 plus 2,250 plus 8,580 plus, plus 13,347 plus 953. This comes to a number of 36,380 and uh, this number of 35,160, the other way of finding out is also a possibility. Is that clear? There will be a small difference that you would be ending up. So, whichever way you feel like you can try. When you have more than one method, it is better that you give them the institute the choice. Do not get the impression that only institute should give you the choice. You can also give institute the choice. Right. 
So all that, because of the approximation that you have made, you will end up with a small difference in the final answer. Okay. Or maybe computationally, one has got to check. Let me just check up once again. Thirty-five one sixty, and this being thirty-six thousand three hundred and eighty. Either way, you can just start, try. Now, let us just proceed at this stage on to an accounting standard, that being NDS thirty-seven. What is that about NDS thirty-seven? Provisions. Contingencies, I mean contingent liability and contingent asset. Okay. <clears throat> uh, say for a moment, I will stop the screen sharing and I will uh, bring out on PPT. See now, let me just take up the screen sharing. See now, let me just take it up. All of you closely follow. What is basically a liability? Liability is basically arising out of past event uh, which will result in present obligation will result in outflow of resources embodying economic benefits in the future. So the first thing that I would like to report is arising out of past events which will result in present obligation which would result in the future outflow of resources embodying economic benefits. This is the order in which a yeah, liability should be defined. So you should not be telling what we owe is a liability. No. It should be resulting out of past events. Past. And that should result in present obligation. And lastly, it should result in outflow of resources embodying economic benefits. Item number three. Correct. Then what do you mean by a provision? A provision is basically a liability. It is also a liability. What characteristic feature that you expect in the case of a yeah, liability, same characteristic feature that you have. Then why it is provision? Why it is separately identified as provision? So please understand that in this particular case, where the final figure is not known, the timing of occurrence also not known. There are two unknowns that you have alongside of the provision. So it is basically a liability, it is basically a liability, but there is an element of uncertainty. There is an element of uncertainty, uncertainty in what? Uncertainty in the time of occurrence and the amount. So there is an uncertainty. So if you are not... Uh, So let me just use a better color. So provision is basically a liability only. I hope this color is clear. 
so it is basically a liability but there is an element of uncertainty there just because it is uncertainty don't jump into conclusion that it is contingent liability so always remember <clears throat> we write in english english is a foreign language and we get into a lot of troubles by not understanding it properly so when i had the opportunity of uh, dealing with uh, in a global accounting standards where most of the audience or all the audience i would say are basically indians but matter related to financial reporting only we are basically having this english as a foreign language there will always be a chance of misunderstanding what is that misunderstanding say i wanted to spend that 2 minutes time because it is a misunderstanding there amongst indians that is the problem let me just tell that let me use that uh, opportunity here so indefinitely there is one particular word that is being used do not related to this particular accounting standard but matter related to financial reporting only especially when you take up intangible asset where you have a specific period or where you have a license life or the life within which the intangible asset is expected to be amortized would mean naturally you can follow unit of production method or street line method for knocking off the intangible asset capital cost into your profit and loss code in the name called amortization instead of depreciation you call that as amortization you can do that no problem you can do that but there could be an intangible asset whose life is identified to be indefinite the life is considered to be indefinite here is a place where we have a very big misunderstanding what is a misunderstanding misnomer this term is misnomer i will not blame indians as a whole but we were into this sort of practice indefinitely means what people normally understand let me tell you on behalf of uh, the whole indians i am going to tell indefinitely means for a long period of time is the general understanding people have which is not correct what is that it is understood generally indefinitely means for a very long period of time see when intangible asset has got indefinite life would mean you should not misunderstand that no depreciation can be charged because we do not know how much life it will have you cannot write off the entire capitalized uh, that is entire capital amount into your profit and loss account you can't do that when life is not there you cannot determine of your own life and charge of faster or slower than required on such occasions what we are expected to do is at the end of each financial year there is accounting here we are expected to check for any impairment loss for that particular asset that means uh, indefinite should be understood as it can lose at any point of time so you have seen something like people telling time bomb what do you mean by time bomb the bomb will explode after some point of time where in almost all in cinemas you would be finding within 15 seconds 20 seconds it will explode the hero who may not be technically competent but somewhere he will be having some scissor and he will cut the correct cable you would have seen that it may be a blue cable most of the times he will cut and it will not explode so time bomb will explode at the expiry of that time whereas a bomb we do not know when it will explode that could be your deepavali bombs you put a fire you, you may not know that it will 
explode now or a little later that is indefinite so people do not uh, people normally misunderstand indefinitely means for a longer period of time actually it is not so it can be lasting only one year or two years or three years we do not know the time but it has got a definite end but we do not know what is that period so for such occasions intangible assets are to be given that is where you have to take up that intangible assets for the test of impairment even if there is no indicators that is what you got to understand so uncertainty means do not jump into conclusion uncertainty means it is contingent no not like that it is uncertain for two important points what are the two important points one we do not know by what point of time it will be incurred we do not know what is the amount that we will be incurring so it is basically a liability but we are uncertain as what point of time it will be incurred and what is the amount of time at which it will be incurred right what is the amount of what is the amount at which it will be incurred we do not know what is the time at which it will be incurred we do not know so just because i do not know the time just because the amount is not known can i postpone can i postpone can i postpone answer to the question is no so we are expected to make a reasonable estimate reasonable estimate not for the time reasonable estimate only for the amount if it were to be incurred after two years or three years would mean you have to take a present value reasonable amount present value also if required present value if required so when it is to be used with present value when it is not to be used with present value if the amount is to be paid within 12 months from the end of the reporting date no present value if it were to be incurred after 12 months from the reporting date only for that portion that will be incurred after 12 months present value will be applicable for that so when you have at various points of time the amounts are to be incurred only for that portion beyond 12 months you have to take it up at present value not for the entire amount so always remember you have got to read with care it is not to be misunderstood that we are expected to incur for all the items this pv within 12 months no pv beyond 12 months pv will be there what pv factor that is provided in the problem that is what you have got to take it up so don't go into greater details there supposing that reasonable estimate is not possible timing is also known uh, sorry is not known amount of incurrence also not known there can be a lot of such scenarios where uh, we would have constructed one particular portion of the factory without uh, the permission from the corporation because it was required for production they have said okay regularization scheme will be there with the industrial control board and as well as chennai corporation we would get uh, a oral permission from them written permission we would not have got after some period of time that regularization when they will be slapping on these industries we do not know how much is going to be the penalty that we have to pay we do not know we would have breached so many compliances and just because the amounts are not known can you just say that uh, we will not uh, say anywhere in the financial statement no it's not like that on such occasions we are expected to report this matter as contingent liability please understand and uh, do not also misunderstand that contingent liability will come only through this route no where it is a liability where timing and amount are not uh, known where reasonable amount or reasonable estimate is not possible then the matter has got to be reported as contingent liability you have got to tell the reason how it will be reported or how it will be stated in the contingent liability so it may be stated as it is a case filed against the company where the damages are not known it may be at the early stages of the case so 
debts against the company not there is a case filed against the company <coughs> the company did not acknowledge that as debts at all amount is not known it is at the very early stage that is also a possibility so it is a liability measured using substantial degree of estimation when that is not possible then contingent liability will automatically be coming is that clear next obligating event so people normally be using this term as obligating event what do you mean by obligating event hmm? the term obligation people misunderstand once again this english is being that is uh, is having lots of problem with the foreign language but at the same time having adopted we cannot be complaining we should know that obligation is to be understood as mandatory but many a times people misuse this what is that i have come for an obligation sir that is not correct usage as how data cannot be considered as appropriate english same is the way I come for an obligation. They will speak in English. They will also tell like that. Say one parent called. I am talking about some 15, 20 years back. One parent called. Sir, deep deep passed away in CA foundation is what he said. For a moment, uh, I was holding my breath. What is that? He said. My daughter. Say, I got a good news is what he said. Okay, good news. What is that, sir? Please. My daughter Deepti passed away in CA Foundation, CACPT. I do not know whether to congratulate or to correct him. And uh, the normal tendency is that when you use English, they will try to show off that they know English. I can't tell, please correct your English. So I just said, okay, sir, great, sir, it's a great news. But don't use that term passed away passed away means died i told him i'm sorry sir is what he said don't say sorry you have to say thank you because i'm correcting you people use misuse those words and uh, people will say yes like this no you should not do that yes is like that and no is like that <laughs> anyway so it's all happening in india we have got to be very careful obligation means mandatory I do not have any alternative course to avoid it, which results in obligation and no realistic alternative to settle obligation. If I have to, I, I can just give you an uh, example for this. I have to wear an hel helmet. See, all of you, some of the examples are just suiting to understand things better. And they are not exact examples. So I got to use helmet when I am on two wheeler. Right. So is that uh, an obligation for me? Answer to the questions no. But many people would think that oh, it is mandatory you got to wear. I will not wear. What is the alternative? Realistic alternative that I have, pay fine. People might ask this question, sir. You are a faculty member. You are preaching non-compliance and all that. Don't take like that. The person is, the person is taking this two-wheeler to his cousin. Leave the two-wheeler to the custody of the cousin because tomorrow he has got to catch a flight to a foreign location for employment. So, a month back he got this two-wheeler. He was about to buy a helmet. He would have thought, okay, when, when I am not there, why should I do this? Similarly, there can be an obligation for a business entity to have a particular pollution control equipment to be installed. But the company preferred not to do it because they are in the process of demolishing that factory to construct a new factory. 
for not complying for that particular order given by the pollution department, they ought to pay fine. It may be fine for them. So, therefore, you got to be very careful. So, don't be emotional. Please just uh, rationally think as whether they have any alternative plans. If they have alternative plans, there is no obligation at all. For the alternative plans, you may have to pay fine and for that you got to provide. You got to be very careful with that. Then, there are two types of obligations that you have. One is present, the other one is possible. What do you mean by present and probable? So, probable list of candidates for election, probable list of candidates for T20 World Cup. What do you mean by that? It is more likely than not. What is that? It is more likely than not. So, when you look into possibility, it is not probable. The chances of that occurring is possible, but it is not probable. What do you mean by that? Tushar Deshpande, there is one particular person who is a bowler. In one of the sports news, I have seen that this gentleman who was the last batsman in his team scored a century. If somebody is asking whether the 11th batsman can score a century would mean, I cannot say impossible. I got to say possible only, but not probable. So, you should always be understanding as when it is present would mean it is probable. When it is possible means not probable. You got to be very careful. Are you clear? Next, what is the similarity between the two? For both present obligation and possible obligation, Evidence should be available on the date of balance sheet. Evidence should be available on the date of balance sheet. Right. Now, now I will be taking up from here. Whenever there is an event, when it is coming under possible, and when it is coming under present, correct? This possible in which I will ask the question, possibility of outflow of resources being remote. Generally, possible would mean it is not uh, always remote. Possibility of outflow of resources being remote would mean what sort of answer you can provide? Yes, no. Possibility of outflow of resources being remote when it is yes would mean do nothing. Do nothing. When it is no means, disclose as contingent liability. Disclose as contingent liability. When the obligating event, when I say it as event, it is obligating. Hmm? Obligating event. When it is present, let me ask a question. Estimate possible. It is not this possible. It is about estimate being possible. Yes and no. When it is yes, provide. When it is no, what should you do? It is a present obligation, but the estimate of amount not possible. Estimate, there is amount. What is that we should do? No means, uh, disclose as 
contingent liability. So, you would be having disclosure of contingent liability coming for both possible as well as present. Correct? Please be careful. Next one. Having said this, we should be in a position to answer examination questions properly. How do we answer? There should always be a template. Template to develop answers. Theory answers for which we have working notes. Normally, we used to see that working notes coming only for problematic questions where some computations they got to do. For theory also, we do have some templates which I consider as working notes. What is a template? So, especially on to provisions, contingent liability and do nothing. I will ask this question, what is a past event? Question mark. Present obligation there? You have to say yes or no. Next one is would result in would result in outflow of resources embodying economic benefits would result in outflow of resources in embodying benefits economic benefits estimate is possible estimate is possible action then lastly pass journal entries Say, please develop this template. So, you attend to class, but we understand things from the class, but we are unable to write. Would mean either it is a problem with a place from where you are learning, or problem is with you. After attending to the class, you should be in a position to write it properly. That means you need to develop some templates. Now, let's just know as how we proceed with the templates. I will just take up through some of the examples that we are going to have it on the screen. A manufacturer gives warranties at the time of sale to purchaser of its product. Under the terms of the contract for sale, the manufacturer undertakes to make good by repair or replacement manufacturing defects that become apparent within three years from the date of sale. On past experience, it is probable more likely than not that there will be some claims under the warranties. This is the case study. We should be in a position to tell the answer how normally CA students would do. I am just making a little fun. Hmm? Do not take it to the heart. They normally provide in the class like God bless you answer they will be telling. This is what I tell. What do you mean by God bless you? When somebody is telling God bless you, 
you will not be asking on what basis you are telling God bless you. You will never ask that question. You will accept, oh, thank you. That type of answer they will be providing. What is that? They will be doing provide, like God bless you, provide. Discloses contingent liability. They will tell as a judge, judgment. They will give you give some, like soothsayers are telling no. Good will result. You don't ask a question on what basis you are telling. Soothsayers. All your problems will get over. You will never be asking on what basis you are telling. That way they will be replying. Provide contingent liability. Do nothing. Don't never tell like that. Don't ever tell your answer like that. That is the sign of weakness. Then you have got to analyze one by one. What is that you have got to tell? Look into the template. This is what we call it as a deducing table. How you deduce? How you conclude? The judge will be providing the judgment based on the findings. He will be writing 1, 2, 3. Even man of the match also they will be telling. There will be 2, 3 contenders. They will be telling. Tushar Deshpande really did well. Ashwin with uh, 6 deliveries he got 24. But Sunil Narayan scored and got 1 wicket. Because of that he is the player of the match. They will be telling like that. You have to tell the reason. Just because I know I like Tendulkar, I cannot be telling. Arjun Tendulkar is a player of the match where he would not have played at all. You cannot be telling like that. Whatever you like is not the answer there. You have to tell on what basis you have derived the answer. First one, past event, present obligation, future course of result, estimate possible, what action and journal entry if any. Whatever I have just written there. On the screen, that is what you find it in the PPT. First one, past event. There is a sale that had happened. Present obligation. Because of the presence of warranty, you are having the obligation. Had you not given the warranty, this obligation would not have got, would have, would have not come there. Very recently, I am just seeing one YouTube advertisement. Hitachi is providing five years warranty. Gas replacement also. Gas replacement also. So that means during the five years period, no money that they will be charging. He would have taken in the initial price itself. It achieves a new, there is a good brand. Future course is that replace or spend. Estimate possible. So here is a place where I want to tell you all of you that a top class secret, don't tell to anybody. What is that? Say for such a question, you should never say no. To say no, you should have some points in the question. So therefore, close your eyes and tell that it is possible only. Yes. Action is, what is that action? Look into that. Look into this. It is a present obligation. Estimating amount is possible. Yes would mean what is that you should do? Provide. So therefore, the answer in this for this particular scenario is action is provide. So this is the way you got to tell. Say I find that you are a good CA intermediate student. You have completed articles in this particular firm. You have just not taken any leave. And therefore, whatever leave that you are requesting, I will grant. This is the way the employer will conclude. Just because you are asking, he will not be giving. So, that will always be a basis. People judge. They will conclude in only in this fashion. Journal entry, yes, debit, profit and loss account and credit should be given to what? Provision for warranty. This is the way you got to communicate. So, yet another and this is the way they answer. That is not the way you can take it up. So, I would like to take up uh, some other uh, example.
So I cannot be taking up all the examples, but I can take up uh, example number five. Legal requirement to fit smoke filters. Under new legislation, an enterprise is required to fit smoke filters to its factories by 30th of uh, September 20XY. The enterprise has not fitted the smoke filters at the balance sheet date on 31st of March XY and X6. So please understand one important thing is by 30th of September XY, whereas at the balance sheet date, there is no obligation at all. Why no obligation is there? Because the statute is expecting them to do it by 30th of September, year is ending by before that, no obligation. Here you feel that uh, there is an obligation. So, all of you please remember a very important thing, the subject matter of provision, if it were to be revenue expenditure, you say it is to be provided. Provide. If the subject matter is expected to be a capex, capital expenditure, people will try to avoid, no. So, <clears throat> please understand, one of your relative is seeing one property and he has got some 60 lakhs, the property is about uh, a crore of rupees. So, can he ask, uh, Murli, please give 40 lakhs, we will buy this piece of land. So, unless you check up the liquidity of the other person, you cannot take it for granted that somebody will be bringing you money. Especially when the money is about to purchase for asset. So, as far as asset is concerned, you cannot take it for granted that the money will be spent immediately by all persons. So, the company might always think that this particular factory to which this smoke filter to be inducted, the factory is such a 40 year old factory where they are having the plans to demolish in the next year. If such be the case, a smoke filter to be mounted on the top of a weak building is going to collapse the entire system. Rather, they will be taking a decision not to fit smoke filters and during the period of non-compliance, they can as well take up the penalty route and therefore, you say once again by this point of time, there is another alternative way through which I can settle this. There is a re realistic alternative that I have. For the first one, no outflow, do nothing. For the second one, <clears throat> The company can dispose of the factory and pay penalty instead of fitting smoke filters. There is more than one realistic alternative and therefore no obligation is resulting even by 31st of March X6. So no outflow will result and uh, where you say it is not applicable, action is do nothing, journal entry is not applicable. All of you please be careful. It is all about a capex would mean you got to be very careful. So, whenever the matter is related to capex, don't immediately jump into conclusion that you have to provide. No, it is not like that. Now, I would like to take up uh, one more. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, example number eight. A court case after a bidding by 20, 24 and 25, 10 people died possibly as a result of food poisoning from uh, products sold by the enterprise. Legal proceedings are started seeking damages for from the enterprise that it disputes liability. Up to the date of approval of the financial statements for the year ending 31st of March X5, the enterprise's lawyers advise that it is probable that the enterprise will not be found liable. However, when the enterprise prepares the financial statement for the year ending 31st of March X6, its lawyers advise that owing to developments in this case, it is probable that the enterprise will be found liable. So, please be careful where they say that in this first case, they said the enterprise will not be found liable. It is probable that the enterprise will not be found liable. So, it is a possibility only. Possible chances, so you have to take it up as contingent liability route. 
So for 31st of March X6, where it is probable that the enterprise will be found liable. So in this case, it becomes a present obligation and you are expected to provide. Correct? That is what, that is the way through which you are expected to answer to that question. Read the answer with greater care and you are just getting the answer in no time. So, I would like to try one more problem that we have at the very initial stage. Example number two. An enterprise in the oil industry causes contamination but does not clean up because there is no legislation requiring cleaning up and the enterprise has been contaminating land for several years. On 31st of March X5, it is virtually certain that a law requiring a clean, clean up land, clean up of land already contaminated will be enacted shortly after the year end. <clears throat> All of you please be careful that by 31st of March X5, it is virtually certain that a law requiring cleaning up of land that were already contaminated by this oil industry. If you ask the question, what was the past event? When you ask the past event is that contamination conducted. Contamination that they have made. What is the present obligation? Present obligation is because of the law which is coming up there. What is the future course of action? Future course of action. Now it is a place where you have to think capex or revenue expenditure. Cleaning up is going to take place at all points of time. It is not a capital expenditure. It is a revenue expenditure. Okay. Then whether it is to, whether this will result in outflow of resources. Yes, you have got to buy material and clean up or engage agency to clean up. So, outflow of resources embodying economic benefits estimate possible. So, I have told you already, you cannot say no. To say no, there should be some inputs. The estimate is possible. So, what is the result? You do not have, you do not have any other alternative measure by paying penalty and all that. So, they have said requiring cleaning up only. You can't say I will not clean up. So, result is that you have got to provide. Contamination, presence of legislation, virtual cert, virtually certain, cleaning will result in outflow, estimate will result, uh, estimate is yes, action is to provide journal entries, debit, P and L account and credit should be given to provision for cleaning. Is that right? Are you clear? That is the way we are expected to take up. So, with that, I would like to try a few more areas in NDS 37 before we could say bye-bye for this one. <clears throat> so, we have onerous contract. Onerous contract. Then, we have contingent. Asset. Then we do have something on reimbursement. These are the other areas which are good amount of focus that you have to make. Only then it will be a complete one. What do you mean by onerous contract? Any idea about that? <clears throat> So, let me tell you that onerous contracts are contracts where the entity committed, entity committed to do, committed to do something without expecting any benefits. The entity committed to do without expecting 
expecting any benefits. So people might ask this question, sir, why at all an entity should be committing without uh, expecting any benefit? At the time of reading itself as a student, I will also be thinking, why a person should commit without uh, expecting any benefit? Only in the case of love and war, this sort of principle will not be applicable. Person, why is waiting for his girlfriend? Why that soldier is waiting in the war friend? You cannot ask any question like that. They, they do that. Even in commercial entity, it will be like that. Say, for example, I have taken a place for rent for five years. It is coming under operating lease. Three years gone and I was having a flourishing business in that particular location. Imagine that I am a franchise, franchisee of Paramudir Sole, Kovai Paramudir Sole. I got an excellent business. Excellent business I was having. And I have put a contract with the landlord for five years. 10,000 square feet area I have just occupied, good parking space, etc. Right. Suddenly, some of the factories closer to our place got gutted. Huge space was consumed by fire. The place was cordoned off by security forces saying that investigation is going on. Our shop is also falling in that cordoned off place. No public is allowed to enter into our shop. Shop is closed virtually. <clears throat> to the landlord, you cannot be telling, I cannot pay rent. Because you have committed. Or it could be a place where you are running one educational institution, say CBSC school. Nearby factory in which factory got shifted to some 40 kilometers distance where government had allotted to all these industrial factories a bigger piece of land with uh, a bigger facility. All of them migrated. All household people have gathered and just gone to the other place. What will happen to the land building etc. that you have constructed, that you have taken it up on lease basis. Three years you are flourishing business. Last of two years you do have. So you are committed which is yeah, definitely a loss which you know pretty well. That is what I told. The entity committed to do without expecting any benefits. They have taken the risk. Who asked you to book it for five years? People at home, they will be asking this question. Who asked you? Did you ask me all this? The CEO's wife will be shouting, why did you do this? Who will know all this in this world? So, you just find two years rent that you got to pay. Will you be taking up as rent for year number four in year number four? And will you be taking up the rent for year number 5 in year number 5. When you know pretty well at the end of year number 3 itself that year number 4 and 5 is going to be a loss. Who asked you to wait for year number 4 to book year number 4 rent as expenditure? Did you really get any benefit out of that? Answer is in the negative. No. What is that we are expected to do? We follow conservatism principle. Prudent principle is that we have to book Next to two years rental payment, even if you are not paying it, you got to book a loss there. You effect payment by year number four. You effect the payment by year number five, but you got to book the loss there. So, onerous contracts are expected to be taken into, into your profit and loss account in the year in which you know that you are going to book a loss, not to wait until the period is getting over. So, provide for, provide at net, that is provide at full as reduced by any possible benefits, any probable benefits. 
what do you mean by probable benefits in the example which i have just conveyed to you that we were having a school the school is totally vacated i got to have two years continuing what i have done is that i have taken that particular place for library gym and uh, we have some swimming pool and all that and i am just thinking of running it as a hotel not a restaurant so i would just not be getting great business but there will be some amount of income i will be getting so i am not expected to book the entire rental the net of that how much ever rent that i am expected to get that i will be deducting and only the net amount will be taken up so provide at full as reduced by any probable benefits for onerous contracts what do you mean by contingent asset contingent assets are expected not to be disclosed not to be disclosed prudent practice however when there is a virtual certainty exception is when there is a virtual certainty pass journal entry that means you start reporting debit as receivable because you have the right to claim until such time we are not expected to disclose so once you have that then you disclose exception when you exception when it is virtually certain reimbursement what do you mean by reimbursement so i would like to share one problem with you people that may not be there in that material that i provided to you but i will just do it now Two moments, I just got it. now i will share all of you just watch out this particular problem that i normally do it in the class just watch out this is about problem number 68 this is about the last item that we have that being reimbursement so if you read this example you can understand what exactly we want to convey problem by 68 let me read out the company is informed prior to the issuance of its financial statement that one of its customers one his one is claim for a defect product delivered in the year under review no provision had been set up as it was believed that no obligation would occur however under the terms of the company supplier agreement the cost of this defect is recoverable from the supplier including an add on penalty of 12 percentage the claim from the customer as of reporting date amounted to 3 million the supplier has already indicated that he will reimburse the company as soon as they have paid themselves and has blocked the funds 3.36 million for this purpose how this matter has got to be handled so first and foremost thing understanding the question itself would be requiring some amount of time i would like you people to go through that once
I hope that you people have just got it right. Now let's know what exactly had happened. Yeah, company is there. Yeah, company is there which buys from their supplier. Yes, supplier is there. From the supplier, they just have it and they supply it to customer. These customers have identified the defect product and they are asking for damages. Is it the fault of this particular company to give a damaged product or defective product and pay damages? Is that that they have prayed that uh, uh, my product should be a defective one, the customer should always be claiming I should be happy to give that. No. Why should I that just to do that? Is it my fault? Definitely A knows that he has just booked a contract with supplier saying that in case the product is a defect one, when I pay the damages, you give not only my damage, but some penalty also. Some penalty also. So, I have agreed to pay 30 lakhs, you people need to pay 33.6 lakhs. Thirty-three point six lakhs, correct. So the supplier had just kept the money ready to give it to A. The moment A pays to the customer thirty lakhs, so that means A, from the viewpoint of A, that A limited. He has got a liability provision to the extent of 30 lakhs. But at the same time, he has got the right to claim for 33.6 lakhs. Just for the sake of understanding, I am giving. I am not promoting the idea that you should provide 33.6 and provide this 30 and all that. In this particular case, what is that we are expected to do? What is it we are expected to do? I will show you the appropriate paragraph of NDS 37 and I will share you that. One moment for that particular moment, I will not be in a position to share. So keep this in your memory. Now I will take up the text of NDS. Now I will be sharing, all of you just watch out, it is para number 53 and 54, all of you closely follow, when I just write, follow para number 53 and 54, that is what I will be telling, I will read it out alongside of you, please be careful. When some or all of the expenditure required to settle a provision is expected to be reimbursed by another party, the reimbursement shall be recognized when and only when. It is virtually certain. This is what I was just talking about as contingent asset. Okay. 
one and only when it is virtually certain that reimbursement will be received if the entity settles the obligation the reimbursement shall be treated as a separate asset that is what i have just mentioned here so about so not to be disclosed exception only when it is virtually certain you have got to pass journal entry did i not tell you that the amount recognized for reimbursement shall not exceed the amount of the provision so when i have a provision to be created only for 30 lakhs reimbursement cannot exceed 30 lakhs and i cannot state it at 33.6 lakhs my asset then i am expected to report my liability for 30 lakhs and i am going and i am expected to report asset for same 30 lakhs even though i may be getting more than 30 lakhs then para number 54 what is that it is saying in the statement of profit and loss account the expense relating to provision may be presented net of the amount recognized for a reimbursement in the debit side of my profit and loss account i got to say to provision for damages payable 30 lakhs less collectible from supplier 30 lakhs outer column nil just because nil is taken to the outer column should i do all this exercise is what people might be asking if you feel that for nil it should not be reported nobody will be knowing anything about this it is not about uh, whether it is nil or any figure based on which you are not reporting fortunately or unfortunately the net figure is nil you do not take any decision just based on the amount that you are taking to the outer column as nil or otherwise in this case it is nil we are expected to report both the provision for the reimbursement as well as the reimbursement that we are seeing from the supplier and we have got to report both in the inner column and the reader will understand all that just because you judge that the outer column is nil i don't have to report would mean you are not uh, making this matter known to readers you are suppressing the fact you can't be telling by not doing it my profit is not affected it is not about the profit only when it is affected you have got to disclose it is not like that that piece of judgment for which you are preventing this information to go into the minds of the users of financial statement 53 and 54 are the two paragraphs that you are expected to use to solve this particular case so with that what is just getting over in days 37 is getting over now it is two hours we have completed there is a 10 minutes break i would like to take 10 minutes break i would like to take so by 16 10 we will resume our session is that okay by 16.10, we will start with EPS. <coughs> that is, in the AS, 33 EPS. We will start by 16.10. We will have something uncommon.
yes we can resume our session uh, sorry for being late by a few minutes few <coughs> three minutes late now let me just start take up Oh. One moment. Now let me just share. Yearnings for share India is 33. We have done two accounting standards. India is 23, borrowing cost, India is 37, provisions, contingent, liabilities, contingent assets, onerous contracts, and reimbursement. <clears throat> Earnings per share is so important for investors to know about what is the expected market price. It is so important information that it is part and parcel of your income statement, that being profit and loss account. So, we all know EPS information is so vital for the equity shareholders in the decision making process which is to be communicated not only for every year end but also for every interim period. Earnings per share is equal to net, invest, net income minus dividend to preferred stockholders divided by weighted average number of equity shares. This piece of information should be provided on the face of the profit and loss account. So important. EPS is to be reported even though the reporting enterprise is reporting loss. You put it out as negative EPS. What is that? You put it out as negative EPS. So, we have preferred stock of two types. Preferred stock of two types. One is cumulative. The other one is non-cumulative we have two one is cumulative the other one being non-cumulative 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 sorry cumulative is the one that we do not expect them to have a declaration carried out. We are expected to deduct from the net income the preferred stock coming under cumulative preferred stock category. What do you mean by that? Whether the net income is positive or negative, we are expected to deduct as a matter of routine the dividend coming from cumulative preferred stock. Cumulative preferred stockholders are expected to 
claim the arrears of preferred dividend in the times of profit. That is, in the times of loss, they cannot be provided. They have the right to claim it in the future when profit is reported. This is what you understand from cumulative preferred stock. Non-cumulative, they do not have the right to claim it in case preferred dividend for a particular year is skipped. Non-cumulative preferred stock dividend has got to be deducted only when it is declared. Even though the rate of dividend is predetermined, we have date of declaration, book closure and payment. These are the three different dates on which generally dividends will be carried out. What is that? Declaration date, book closure date and payment date. Declaration is a must for non-cumulative preferred stock to find a place in the computation of EPS. Net income minus preferred stock I need to deduct without even declaration for cumulative, need to deduct in the case of non-cumulative only upon declaration. This is what you got to understand. Therefore, cumulative preference dividend cannot be deducted once again because they were all deducted in the respective years. EPS shall be computed after taking into account cumulative preference dividend even though it is not declared. But declaration is so important for deducting in case of non-cumulative preference dividend. Next, arrears of preference dividend shall not be considered in the arrival of EPS because in the respective years, the term arrears will come only for cumulative. The term cumulative will give them the right to deduct in the respective years. So therefore, you do not have the right to claim it in the future because in the respective years, it got those items will get deducted. There is something called as diluted EPS. It shall be given with the same status as that of basic EPS. What do you mean by diluted EPS? Capitals are raised by companies by variety of ways. For example, convertible preferred stock, convertible debentures, options, warrants, etc. Convertible preferred stock would mean the preferred stock redemption will not be carried out in the form of cash. It will be substituted in the form of equity shares, common stock. In the case of convertible bond, same thing, instead of repaying the money, they will substitute with equity. And in the case of options, when they exercise, after paying the subscription, that is exercise money, shares will be allotted. And in the case of warrant also, it is like that. These are, these items are all potential future equity shares. Presently, they are not in the form of equity, but they may cause greater number of equity shares in the future. When the level of earnings were to be the same as in the past, when the levels of earnings in the future were to be the same as in the past, with changes in the form of capital from convertible to converted, you would find greater amount of numbers in the denominator the weighted average number of equity shares might go up on account of conversion. On the numerator side, you would be finding that we are expected to change the numerator also. How come? If we were to deduct preference dividend in the computation of basic EPS, we are expected to reverse that, we are expected to add back. In case of convertible bond or convertible debt instrument, we are expected to add back their coupon or interest on after-tax basis. In other cases of options and warrants, we would not have debited to profit and loss any sums or we would not have appropriated from retained earnings towards dividend. 
So no change we are expected to make up for warrants and options, whereas we would have made changes to the net income on account of convertible bond and convertible preference stock. So where we are expected to make changes both in the numerator as well as in the denominator, upon such changes when the expected EPS upon such changes were to be less than what was initially computed, we call we would call that as diluted earnings per share. We would call that as diluted earnings per share. If such change is expected to increase the value of basic earnings per share, then we will not call it out as concentrated EPS, rather we will put it out as anti-dilution or anti-diluted EPS. Only the next point is very important point, only such capital which is ranking for dividend alone shall be considered for the purpose of arriving at weighted average number of equity shares. This is what we will be referring to as VANES. So maybe in global practice in CP and all that they use Weighted average common stock, VAX, here veins. okay. So, why would the capital not rank for a dividend? So, people would ask this question. Only such capitals which is ranking for dividend alone shall be considered for the purpose of arriving at of veins and VAX. Why would a capital not rank for a dividend? Yes. So, when a capital is introduced during the current period, where there can be some capital they would have issued on account of business combination or on account of merger or on account of reverse merger, there can be humpteen things possible in the change of capital. There will always be a hardcore capital that you would be having. There could be new capital which would have come into the stream also you would be having. You tell to those common equity, that is common shareholders or equity shareholders who have come into the new stream saying that in the first year of their presence, they are not eligible for equity capital, that is equity dividend, where they say that uh, they will be participating in the dividend in the future. There can be lot of such compulsions would be there. There could be a lot of practical considerations would be there. So therefore, certain capitals will not be part of your dividend participation. So do not consider those capitals which are not part of your dividend participation. So have that in your mind. So only those capitals which are participant in Dividend alone taken for weighted average number of equity shares. Then we do have something called as bonus issue, bonus dividend or stock dividend you call by different names. Bonus issue in India, stock dividend in US. So when you read documents, when you read according standards, US GAAP, IFRS, NDAs and all that, we need to get adjusted to such terms, bonus issue, stock dividend or same. What is it you have bonus issue affected shall be considered as if bonus shares were in existence from the earliest reporting period. Bonus may be declared after nine months. Just three months before the year end. Can you expect the bonus shares to participate in the dividend to the full? Answer to the question is yes. Why would bonus shares be eligible for dividend participation for the whole period? We all know what is bonus issue. From the retained earnings or from the reserves, additional capital they would have issued. These reserves were there with the company for a long period of time. Shares are issued to existing shareholders in the same proportion. There is no change in the percentage holding by each shareholders. 
where they will have additional capital, additional number of shares that they will be holding. Since the resources were there with the company for a very long period of time, logically speaking, you find that they are eligible for the full dividend. Why should I make those changes for the earliest reporting period? That means when I have to make those changes only for the current period where you find a greater number of shares coming up there, where in the previous period these bonus shares were not there at all. If I have in the previous period 10,000 shares where bonus shares were issued on 1 is to 1 basis, during the current period you will have 20,000 shares. The previous year's net earning after preference dividend were to be deducted by 10,000 quite naturally. The EPS of the previous year will be on the higher side because of the fact of 1 is to 1 bonus issue made during the current period. The earnings per share, even though the current year's earnings were greater, because of the fact that the number of equity shares doubled, there will be a drop in the earnings per share. Prima facie users of financial statement would find that the current year's earning per share dropped and therefore they will get into wrong conclusion that the company is not doing well. Therefore, they cannot prevent, they cannot prevent the bonus shares from taken into our computation. Current year figure has got to be deducted with 20,000 only in order to level them or take them in the same level for comparison. Not only the changes you got to make for the current period but also for the previous period only then it will be fairer comparison. The earliest reporting period is including the previous period. Next one is that what is this diluted earnings per share? Why at all this diluted earnings per share is given importance? So we understand that diluted earnings per share when you are not reporting in advance, there will be a jerk there is going to be a shocking thing the investors would be feeling upon conversion of these potential equity shares into equity shares they would be finding a drop in the earnings per share because of the fact that your denominator went up. When your denominator is going up there is going to be a drop in the earnings per share. So the general presumption or generally people conceive in their mind or perceive in this mind when there is a drop in EPS they will think that the company is not doing well. It is not that their earnings are dropped it is because of the greater number of equity shares that come because of the conversion that took place the fall would have been there. So even before the fall is actually resulting you are running through a trial one and say that your future earnings per share is likely to drop. So in cricket played in local levels in street levels, we will say the first delivery, trial delivery, trials. After the first one, then they will start saying all reals will just go for the reality. Likewise, if you were to continue to have the same earnings with increased quantity of equity shares on account of potential equity shares coming up for during the future period of time, we will visualize what will be the impact on the earnings per share if it is likely to drop. You call that as diluted earnings per share. If it were to raise, 
then you call it out as anti dilution it is a sort of a writing on the wall this is likely to happen please be careful tomorrow it is going to rain heavily please take care there is going to be a cyclone please don't venture into the sea as how meteorological division is giving you a precautionary notice so that you can save yourselves same is the way the diluted earnings per share for upward dilution no reporting is expected so when you find many instruments there you have both uh, convertible bond, convertible preferred stock and options. One may be anti-dilutive, one may be dilutive. But if you consolidate all that, when you report, it may be dilutive. So you may not know as which is causing dilution, which is causing anti-dilution or all that. So therefore, you are expected to evaluate them separately. You are expected to report them separately. That means for each potential instrument, we are expected to find what sort of impact it is likely to cause on the numerator firstly, denominator secondly, and lastly on the EPS. There are three points that you got to have, numerator, denominator, and EPS. The effective dates are to be taken for the calculation of weighted average number of equity shares and not the actual date of issue of shares. Sometimes what will happen is that equity shares are issued at a later point of time than on the actual date of transaction. So if I were to be a startup company, imagine that I have just developed an app that is good for a banking sector where I have approached Infosys which supplies majority of the software to the bankers. To them I am telling you, telling them that this app when it is injected into your software, these many features that your banker will be getting which he can pass it on to his customer where they will recognize their through their app, their face, their voice, etc. And they can instruct the banker for transfer of money just like that. Imagine that it is fully protected. You have got the best system in this world. Everybody is appreciating. With this, India will reach a great heights. Infosys promising to purchase the app from you where they say 30 crores of rupees at which they are buying. We are feeling very happy. We have spent around 5-6 crores, 2-3 years, 30 crores. Vipro is telling that they would like to buy for 70 crores. The offer had gone to 100 crores. 100 crores. Infosys agreed to take it up for 100 crores, initially 30 and it had gone up like that. But, they tell that they will pay equity shares that is only in the form of equity shares, not in the form of cash. And that too, they say that they will issue equity shares only on 1st of November, not now. Today, 1st of April, but 1st of November only they can give. It is not that they do not have less confidence on the product. It is not that. During this period, there can be some bonus issue, there can be rights issue and all that. In the rights issue, a shareholder is expected to contribute money to the company. If shares were issued to us, then to keep our control on the company, we have got to contribute money. Where we are parched of money. We do not have the money. Therefore, such a discomforting scenario should not be happening to this person is what the Infosys might think that we will agree for that, but I will issue the shares only by 1st of November. It is just a comforting information for us. 
But for weighted average number of equity shares computation, we have got to take up But we are expected to take up those shares on 1st of April and not on 1st of November. That is what they said. Weighted, weight is to be assigned uh, taking number of months and face value of the shares into consideration. In case of rights issue is made at a price lower than the face value, fair value. There is a concession offered to the existing shareholders. We have a formula for that. I will be discussing about that. The concession offered is to be quantified in terms of free shares. There is bonus shares. And whatever treatment given to bonus shares shall be given to rights shares also. So we will discuss this alongside of the problem. Similarly, when shares are bought back, the price offered will be greater than the fair value. Whenever there is a concession offered to the shareholders that will cause dilution, that dilution should also be captured in all our computation. When shares are issued with differential rights, EPS should also be reflecting the different rights towards dividend. This point we have already discussed when you have more than one potential equity shares, then we are expected to do it one after the other because one may be anti-dilutive, the other may be dilutive. You are expected to take a only dilutive equity shares among, and amongst them, which one is the most dilutive, second most dilutive and so on. So with that, in the AS, 33 theory portion is over. Now we can take up problems for solving. So kindly recall that uh, this problem is book back question number four. This second question. In institute study material, this is not taken up at 11.44. They have taken it about taken it up at 44.4375 percentage in full. Because of that, small difference will be there. Please just do not worry about that. Institute is not uh, taking your answer as wrong, you would have rounded it off to 11.44, whereas they have taken it up at 11.4375. And because of that, the answers are a little different. That's it. There is another way also I told you that you can do it. That is also a possible answer. So how do I know that it could be a possible answer? See, we just deal with uh, not only NDAs, IFRS, US gap and all that. So, in all these places, how they just uh, tackle, we were just knowing it. That's it. Okay, 33 we will take it up. I should have provided the index maybe in the next class I can just do that. Sorry, India is 33. Yeah. So, I was just telling about uh, rights, rights issue with bonus element. 
question number one we will be taken up <clears throat> on 31st of december 20 x1 the issued share capital of a company consists consisted of 1.8 million ordinary shares of rupees 10 each fully paid the profits for the year ended 31st of december x1 and x2 amounted to 630,000 and 875,000 respectively. On 31st of March X2, the company made a rights issue on a 1 for 4 basis at rupees 30. The market price of the shares immediately before the rights issue was 60. Calculate earnings per share. Okay. Now let us just try. See, now that you do have objective type question, even in the case of financial reporting, this may be a problem and they may be providing A, B, C, D with one right answer, the other one closer to the right answer, they will be providing. So you just don't worry about that. Uh, they have changed the paper drastically. No. Instead of asking what is the final answer which was not known, now you have one of those answers being given in the problem where you may have to identify that. So, therefore, objective type question had not really changed the character of this particular paper. In fact, I would just see scoring had just gone up. <clears throat> now, let us just take up on the question number one. Question number one. This is page number 19. 19 of 73. So, bonus element in rights issue. So, we are talking about bonus element in rights issue. This is 12th slide. In case rights issue is made at a fair value, lower than fair value. Made at a price lower than the fair value. Then there is a concession offered to the existing shareholders. The concession offered is to be quantified in terms of free shares. That is bonus shares. Whatever treatment given to bonus shares, the same treatment should be extended. This particular item, I said I will explain. Now that we have got a chance that we will be explaining it here. So, all of you, market order is very, very important. So, we will go step by step. Step number one. Theoretical X rights price. M into N plus R into S divided by N plus R. Where M stands for market price per share prior. N stands for number of equity shares prior. Or number of equity shares qualifying for a right R stands for number of rights shares S stands for subscription price of rights shares first step is this this we will call it out as X, theoretical X rates price X.
now 144 held market price existing market price immediately before rates issue is 60 60 into 4 plus 1 into 30 divided by 4 plus 1 270 divided by 5 please just check up How much is that? 50? Oh. Or you can work out 60 into how many number of shares prior to that? 1.8 million. Plus 1.8 into 1 by 4 into 30. The whole divided by 1.8 plus 1.8 into 1 by 4. Same answer you will be getting. But some people will feel like that they are ha happy with this. One twenty one point five divided by two point two five. One twenty one point five divided by two point two five. You just get the same number as fifty four. Correct? Whichever way you feel like that you are comfortable, you can do it. Step number two. How do we take up for step number two? Step number two, bonus element is equal to, bonus element is equal to M divided by X. That is bonus element or bonus factor m divided by x which is 60 divided by 54 which is equal to 1.1111111 Step number three, weighted average number of equity shares, weighted average number of equity shares, where you got to look for the period at which it was just done. They follow calendar year and rights issue was made three months after the start. We are expected to work out this bonus factor for the prior periods. Weighted average number of equity shares periods are 2. 20 x1 and 20 x2. 20 x2 is split into prior and post. 3 months period and 9 months period. Correct? 3 months period and 9 months period. Number of equity shares prior. 1.8 million or 18 lakhs. Rights issue, one for four held. One for four held. 
how much is that we will be taking up for one for four held come on Four lakh fifty. That is Three lakh thirty-seven thousand five hundred. Here, what is that we will be doing? Eighteen lakhs into one point one 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 into three by twelve. Is that right? Is that right? Uh, no, not right actually. Because 18 lakhs you are already having. Uh, I will put it like this way. I will not take it up here. Hmm? This is rights issue. In this particular case, 18 lakhs into 1.1111111 into 12 by 12 for the previous period. How much is that? 20 lakhs. I will not take it up this. So, these are all, let it be there for the purpose of computation. So I don't want to remove it. Correct. Now, weighted average number of equity shares will be 20 lakhs here which is going to be for this 12 months period 18 lakhs plus 1 moment Hello Andre one moment, I will just check up. Ah, uh, yeah. So, this is going to be 50,000 because I have just multiplied this 1.111 alongside of 18. So, 18 lakhs I have already included, but it is 50,000 only because this four this 500,000 is inclusive of 450 for the whole year. 
प्लस थ्री थर्टी सेवन फाइव हंड्रेड आर यू अंडरस्टैंडिंग दिस वन पॉइंट वन 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 इनटू थ्री बाय ट्वेल इज इंक्लूडिंग दैट सो फॉर दिस पर्टिकुलर पीरियड हाउ मच इज द वेटेड एवरेज नंबर ऑफ इक्विटी शेयर्स एटीन लाख प्लस फिफ्टी थाउजेंड प्लस थ्री थर्टी सेवन फाइव 21 lakhs 87,500. Is that right? Are you clear? All of you? So, all of you please understand this 500,000. Here, what I have just written is correct. But thing is that it is 1.111111. This one is included, which is towards 18 lakhs. So, I am not supposed to take up this one, though it is a bonus factor. I am supposed to use zero point. Therefore, this amount is not 500,000, it is 50,000. Correct? And therefore, the number for the current period is going to be what? 21 lakhs 87,500. Correct, Arda? Are you clear? So, this is what we are expected to carry out. If the market price immediately before the rights issue, calculate EPS. Say now that, you know, weighted average number of equity shares, this being working note number 2. Uh, this is for weighted average number of equity shares. We have got step number 3 we have completed. Now we will take it up to the next stage. Here, December 20x1 and 20x2. Net income 630,000 and 875,000. Weighted average number of equity shares being 20,000, 21 lakhs 87,500. Am I right? Earnings per share is equal to 630,000 divided by 20 lakhs comes to 0.315. That being 878,000 divided by 21 lakh 87,500. 0.40. Correct? This is for the year. For the year ending. 20x2. Supposing this is for the year ending 20x1, then the net income is going to be 630,000. Weighted average number of equity shares would have been 18 lakhs 630,000 divided by 18 lakhs should give you 0.35. Correct? 0.35 is the answer. Is that right? Is that clear? Correct on the right? So, do not give any room for any sort of second opinion. So, to which year this EPS is to be computed, they are not mentioned. You do it for X1 and X2. So, what it was 35 paisa is 31.5 paisa in the following period. Same thing, you have it in a different way. Is that okay? Now, 
I will tell you as how you can cross verify also. How much was the bonus issue, rights issue? One for? Oh. Okay. Anyway, this particular uh, thing, we are expected to work out and this sort of changes is what you call it out as what? Adjusted EPS. The same EPS is getting changed. I will tell you how. So, how you can just do this adjusted EPS for which there is a shortcut method that you have? Prior period main EPS or basic EPS into divided by bonus factor divided by bonus factor how come i know the bonus factor here what is this bonus factor it is 10 by 9 60 divided by 54 is 10 by 9 look into that prior period basic eps was 35 paisa divided by bonus factor 10 by 9. That means 0.35 into 9 divided by 10. How much is that? 0 0.315. Just like that you can get it. Please be careful. Mark it out as very important. That you are getting the number just like that. You can cross verify. I do not know as whether Institute had just worked out this adjusted EPS through this particular formula. Adjusted EPS equal to prior period, that is earlier period basic EPS divided by bonus factor of the current period. During the period of that. No, it, it is picked up only from Institute material. So, when we have time, we can just get back for discussion, more discussion on EPS. At this moment, we just don't want to cramp it with this particular one. Now, we will take up on to NDIS 10. These are all such accounting standards where one can easily get yourself adjusted. In India, yes, these are all similar to that of whatever we have studied in intermediate level. To gain the confidence that uh, these are all the same, I thought I will take up these items. The material which I have just shared to ICAI, all these questions were picked up only from institute study material. They are all not the solved ones which are there in book back. Okay. When time is permitting, we will solve all that. Now, we will proceed to IND AS 10 events occurring after 
रिपोर्टिंग पीरियड इन एस टेन इवेंट अकरिंग आफ्टर रिपोर्टिंग पीरियड What is it we have in events occurring after reporting period? We have one financial year. Events related to the financial year will fall in the same financial year. These are all events. These are all events of this particular year, financial year. This is next financial year. You find events are happening in the following period. You find This is 22, 23. This is 23, 24. All these green ones were related to 22, 23. Yellows were all 23, 24. If events related to 22, 23, where you come to know only by 23, 24, should that be taken up as Transaction related to 22-23 or to be taken up as part of 23-24 is the question. Even though the transaction had happened in the year 23-24 related to 22-23, before the approval, before the approval, then these matters are expected to be connected to the financial year 22-23. Even though an event related to 22-23 had happened after the date of approval, this is before approval. This is the reporting date. This is the reporting period. This is before approval, but after reporting date, this is after approval. This portion you ignore because it had occurred after approval. So, the title for this particular accounting standard is events occurring after reporting period related to that particular financial year that we are taking up. How this item has got to be taken up is the matter. What is that? How that event relate events related to financial year 22-23 has got to be taken up. So now it is events occurring after reporting date. It's all clear. Now that two event two items are events occurring after reporting period shall be classified into two. Now you know what is events occurring after reporting period related to one financial period occurring after the reporting period but before the approval they are to be considered as events occurring after reporting period where you differentiate them into two as adjusting on the other one being non-adjusting. In adjusting we have got to adjust. Adjust in books. Here for non-adjusting, we are expected to disclose. Where we are expected to disclose. Or we are expected to redraft. Instead of disclosing or redraft financial statement. If it were to be serious, we will be doing that. How do you know that it is an adjusting event or non-adjusting event? All of you please understand that events occurring after balance sheet, uh, occurring after reporting date should either be 
affecting the asset or the liability there. We will not be talking anything about revenue item. We will talk only about capital item. Either it will be an asset or it will be a liability. Events occurring after balance sheet date will not be having any expenses. It will be either asset or liability. So, even though it is matter related to the financial year, take this particular item and connect it to the reporting date. Whether these events, whether these events is taking a final shape here on the position of the asset or liability on the reporting date. Can you relate these events to the condition of the asset on the reporting date? What is that we are telling? Connect events to the condition or situation of the assets and liabilities on the reporting date. In the case of non-adjusting, cannot be connected to the assets and liabilities on the reporting date. What is that? Adjusting events or those events which could be connected to the condition or situation of assets and liabilities on the reporting date, non-adjusting events cannot be connected to the assets and liabilities on the reporting date. That's all. You make inquiry. First step, what is that you should do? First step, you just check up as whether it is events occurring after balance sheet date or not. Second step, what is that you should do? Check up as whether you could connect or you could not connect. Whether you can connect or cannot connect. That will result in whether they are adjusting or non-adjusting. If it were to be adjusting, adjust. If it were to be non-adjusting, Either a disclosure should be made or you may have to redraft the balance sheet. So, the matter is related to when it is disclosure. The earlier accounting standard AS4 in which disclosure has got to be made by board of directors. Whereas, NDAS 10 is telling that it is to be disclosed in accounting. The disclosure responsibility got shifted from board of directors to the preparers of financial statement. Disclosure from director's report, now it has just come to the financial statement. That is to be noted as very important point. Simply disclosing may be appropriate at intermediate level. You may have to tell that AS4 indicating disclosure by directors. Whereas in India, AS10, disclosure has got to be made in financial statement. Notes and disclosures as part of your general purpose financial statement, there you got to report. Correct. Supposing the non adjusting event is likely to affect the going concern concept. Then disclosure is not sufficient. What is that? Disclosure is not sufficient. You may have to redraft. For example, imagine that there is a small wound is there here on the nose. Put a plaster onto this 
and push no problem imagine that this wound is not at all healing then i have to take a serious consulting i got to check up as whether it is malignant and uh, biopsy test i got to give correct that means when the going concern of the entity is shaked because of this event when you classify it as non adjusting simply simple disclosure will not be sufficient we are expected to redraft the financial statement that means you tell very clearly you tell in you tell that in no uncertain terms that means in all certain terms that the company is likely to get liquidated or in the brink of bankruptcy and what framework under which the financial statements has got to be prepared you got to do that so if the finding were to be a cancer where the test is showing positive applying plaster is fooling you got to take adequate measures okay i am just like that not telling some not so happened events i'm talking about actually happened events only for few moments i can tell the real fact it is not on nose i'm talking about on dental we had a neighbor who had some four five younger brothers four younger brothers now i remember and uh, the youngest brother who was working in chennai who had a particular doctor to treat his dental problems so being young he had lot of frequent uh, dental problems that particular doctor was attending to him later this gentleman got shifted to with the same department to bangalore on one of those early mornings i could see this gentleman was at neighbor's place i was asking what for he had just come he said he has just come to check up with a dental doctor i said don't you have doctor in bangalore person asked you got a right question i am very happy to show this to my doctor from the childhood itself i was having some problem he will understand it better and if i have to go to your doctor in bangalore i got to tell the entire history and i take this as an opportunity to visit my elder brother he was just telling okay that particular day appointment was fixed the person was about to go for root canaling deep on the last few on the bottom line not on the bottom line on the top while it was performed they have seen some strange, strange structure they have just done some x ray and all that but while they were doing they found something very different they have stopped all that the senior doctor called all the junior doctor there and seen something very different and they have said it is better that you go to cancer institute for checking now you can understand that going concern concept of that particular person is being shaken because of that particular finding you cannot be 
ignoring that particular matter as non-adjusting and say that disclosure is sufficient. You got to take. Story is not at over. The person had just went, prayed all, said that it should not be a cancer. Test shown positive only. What is that? Positive only. But there is one good thing in that positive, it is at the very early stage. At the very early stage. So they have four stages. So fortunate that that particular cancer did not cause any irritation or pain, but something else on to the dental structure caused the pain, which resulted in root canaling. That point of time, they saw that something different. And it is not because of the cancer, he got a pain and that was not the case. A portion of that jaw was taken out. A portion of the jaw was taken out. His face itself, which was considered to be a square one, had become a triangle. Some portion gone there. Why would I take that much of extra time for you to explain is that when that entity's going concern concept is affected on account of non-adjusting event, a small procedure of disclosure will not be sufficient. You may have to redraft the financial statement so that reader will understand that something serious had happened which cannot be adjusted in the books of accounts where the matter has got to be done. So, when I have taken that much of time, you can easily remember and try accordingly in the main examination. I hope that this would be sufficient for India. Now, let us just go through our problems for practice. Yeah, India is 33 years Insert material. Every pause, solve it. This one, the other point. So previously, AS four, we had in Previously, we had in AS4, where you say it is events occurring after balance sheet date. Here it is not about date, it is about the period. Because event is related to a particular period only. This is correct. Whereas the earlier one, we used to say events occurring after balance sheet date, that is not correct. I would like to take up question number three. XY Limited took a large sized civil construction contract for a public sector undertaking valued at 200 crores. What about? Valued at 200 crores, the execution of the project started in X1, X2 and continued in the next year. During the execution on 29th of May X2, the company found while raising the foundation work that it had met a rocky surface and cost of the contract would go up by extra 50 crores which would not be recoverable from the contract as per the terms of the contract, the company's financial year ending 31st of March X2. And the, com and the financial statements were considered and approved by board of directors on 15th of June X2. How will you treat the above financial statement for the year ended 31st of March X2? So, if there is any possibility of you communicating, can you communicate? 
Now let me just explain this matter that the project got started. in 21-22. On 29th May, they have found rocky surface and board of directors approval took place on 15th of June. So, this had happened before approval. So, therefore, it is basically events occurring after reporting period. Now the question is whether it is an adjusting event or non-adjusting event will be a big question. So here I am not just having one-to-one -one reply or feedback. I will give you a chance for you to type it out in case it is possible. Play recover. Live chat line. So, if you ask me the question as whether it is an adjusting event or non adjusting event, many would sound this as non adjusting and uh, they would take this up as a matter for disclosure because on the reporting date what is that on the reporting date you would find the asset was in good position like uh, is what the people would be telling See, understand very clearly that the rocky surface they met on 29th of May should not be misunderstood that rocky surface came up on 28th of May night and on 29th of May you met this. It is not like that. The rocky surface was there even on the Reporting date that is 31st of March X2. The construction company did not apply prudent practices to know about the type of surface, type of land on which they are taking up the construction activity. They failed to do that and therefore we should classify it as an adjusting event because on the day of the reporting date on 31st of March X2, the asset that being the project was in a bad shape, which the company knew only on 29th of May, which is considered to be a very a bad thing for the company. They should have just done prudent practices. They should have found it on that particular point of time itself. The company did not or did not apply prudent practices to know all that or failure to know about the condition of the asset is different from that of the condition of the asset. Condition of the assets was so bad and they did not had adequate amount of knowledge about that particular item of asset. Therefore, the condition of the asset was so bad, you have got to provide for in their books of accounts and it is to be taken up as an adjusting bill. Similar to that of a scenario, we can take it up like 15th of June on 29th of May, a customer had reported that uh, he had applied for insolvency and he will not be in a position to pay the money because his factory was destroyed by fire. 
would mean whether it is an adjusting event or non adjusting event for which you should know as by what point of time the accident took place if the accident had taken place prior to 31st of march on this date the receivable was doubtful even though he came to know about that fact only on 29th of may by by 30, by 31st of march itself it was not good not good and doubtful therefore they got to provide imagine an opposite scenario had, had occurred that the accident took place on 1st of april 23 if that be the case on the balance sheet date, it was good why would then we have got to provide so a particular information regarding a bad or doubtful happening of a receivable can can either be classified as adjusting or non adjusting depending upon as by what point of time that accident took place if that accident that taken place prior to the year end then on the year end date on the reporting date it was bad therefore we have got to provide if that accident had happened after the reporting date then on the reporting date it was good so no provision is required adjusting you cannot classify it as adjusting you have to classify it as non adjusting so that way you have got to decide so in this process i would say that we have completed india yes 10 so until this moment it is india yes 23 we have done 37 we have done 33 we have done and 10 we have done now i would like to put you on to business combination in the as 103 without any preparation on 103 no ca final student should go to examination such is the important thing that you have in the case of 103 four accounting standards which are considered to be in ordinary or average accounting standards we have taken up super good accounting standard is taken up now what is that 103 you call this as what business combination in this business combination you have merger you have acquisition you have reverse merger etc or reverse acquisition what is the or you can even have de merger also so in fact i will put it like this way merger de merger acquisition reverse acquisition and so on in all these cases there will be one party to buy minimum parties minimum two maximum any number so for simplicity sake for simplicity sake we take only two 
what is that we take simply two what are the two parties acquirer buyer acquiry seller or vendor who is expected to pay purchase consideration pay purchase consideration seller what is that he will be doing he will sell the business sell the business so therefore an acquirer is expected to identify profit or loss what is that profit or loss on acquisition light number only in the case of business combination upon purchases you would be finding gains and losses generally gains and losses will be reported only upon sale of any activity the light number two. generally profit or losses will be done only upon sale only in the case of business acquisition upon purchases you will be having profits and losses so loss and acquisition will be referred to as goodwill gains on acquisition will be referred to as bargain purchases or bargain i don't want to use purchases bargain you have gained all of you closely follow you can arrive at this gain and goodwill only when there is a sale of business instead of what do you mean by business then in business you should have input plus process and plus output you should have a system like raw material process and output likewise when you say as a business it should have input it should have process it should have output only then it is a business all of you closely follow a very important thing that you have what is appearing to be as sale of business or in this particular case when you find that it is a sell the business would mean as far as the acquirer is concerned it is purchase of business what it appears to you as or in the eyes of general public that there was a purchase of business and sale of business but ultimately when it is turning out to be purchase of assets of the other company then automatically the acquirer the buyer will lose the privilege of accounting the gain or loss 
that we were talking out in the name called goodwill and bargain. For this, whether you have purchased the business or not, there is one test that you have. What is the test name? Concentration test. What is that? Concentration test is there. When you have business combination, for business there should be some life to it. When I say that there is a business, there should be a life into the business. Only then it is business. Please understand that one actor was just calling in this fashion. It is only a statue. You are offering garland to the statue. You are litting lamps in front of the statue. You are burning agarbatis in front of the statue. What is the meaning of doing this before statue? You people are unable to explain as why you are doing before a statue. Is what he was just telling. He thought that he is a rationalist. He tweeted in his X platform that he was he was just feeling that he is a forward thinker. Down came the reply there, you are a person. When there is no life, you are a dead body. What is the difference between a dead body and a person? There is a life, no. Likewise, all assets and liabilities together, when you have a life to it, it becomes business. When the life is missing, it is not business. Then, what it appears to you or appears to everybody that it is purchase of business, but when it is failing in concentration test, it will not be considered as purchase of business, it will be considered as purchase of assets and liabilities. Correct? I will give you a classic case where, or I would like to take up our institute study material and discuss from the institute study material something about concentration test. Now, I will stop sharing. Now, I will take up that right now. Now I will share the screen, all of you please just watch. Do you remember that I was just referring about concentration test? As per para B7A of the application guidance of India's 103 and optional test, the concentration test has been in, introduced to permit a simplified assessment whether an acquired set of activities and assets is not a business. On the above test, following will be the consequences. When the test is met, not a business, no further assessment is needed. 
when test is not met, further assessment to be made. Here, the test is for business or not for business. Now, let us just see that. So, all of you, please just understand that this example through which we will be discussing is so important. Same problem will come in the main examination. So, instead of reading those numbers right now, I would like to take up straight away the problem so that what we need to read, you can put it in this flow chart and from there we will be in a position to understand what exactly is that. So, summary to determine whether transaction is a business or not. Acquired input and process. The acquired item were all input and process. Yes. Whether output exists at the acquisition date. Yes. Where it is critical to the ability to continue producing outputs and inputs acquired, included, and organized experienced workforce to perform that asset. Yes. And if it is yes, go to B. What is B? Substantive process is acquired. It is a business combination. Now I will give you a classic case, then you can easily understand. I have become a very big businessman. I got lots of money. I wanted to invest in civil aviation business. So I find a Kingfisher or for that matter Indigo. Let us take up Indigo. I have acquired all the assets of Indigo. I have assumed all liabilities. Imagine that all the crew members of Indigo, they are not liking me. And all of them have just uh, resigned. What did I buy? Did I buy business or buy only business? Sorry, assets. Only when I have main material machine, then it will become a business. When I have acquired assets, when I have not bought the confidence of men to work under me, then what I have done is not purchase of business. I have simply purchased only assets. Correct? That is what you have. You just look into the combination acquired inputs and process. Yes, whether outputs exist at the acquisition date. Yes, where it is critical, all that. Include an organized workforce to perform that process. Yes, I should have input, I should have process, I should have output, I should have workforce. If all the four were to be there, then it is what? Go to B, B is business combination. Imagine that I do not have the workforce. No. Whether acquired process is unique, scarce or cannot be replaced without significant cost or effort. If it is yes, then go to B. If it is no, go to A. Go to A. No substantive process is acquired. It is not business combination. It is only an asset acquisition. All of you, please just understand this concentration test is a very important factor. So far, they are not touched in the main examinations in the past. Now, let us just take up into this particular question. A holds 20 percentage in B. Subsequently, A acquires another or further 50 percentage in B by paying 300 crores. The fair value of assets acquired and liabilities assumed are as follows. Building 1000 crores. Cash and cash equivalent 200, financial liabilities 800, DTL 150, fair value of B is 400 crores and the fair value of NCA is 120 crores, fair value of entity A's previously held interest is 80 crores, entity A needs to determine whether acquisition is an asset acquisition as per concentration test. First one. Presently, they bought a 
they have bought 50 percentage at present for how much 300 crores they got already 20 percentage already they got 20 percentage what is the fair value today for that today that 20 percentage they bought long time back but that is 80 crores the remaining 30 percentage held by non-controlling interest what is the value for that fair value of the non-controlling interest is 120 now what is the net asset value? So now 500 crores fair value of the liability assumed excluding deferred tax 800 cash and cash equivalents 200 fair value the gross assets being 1100. So this is what we can consider as part of purchase consideration. What is the value of net assets you have? The fair value land, there is building, cash and cash equivalent, Fair value of the gross assets, 1100 is what they are telling. Okay. Okay. See, they are just doing the reverse working. So, I will put it like this way, PPE. thousand cash and cash equivalent two hundred financial liabilities eight hundred so it is going to be four hundred that is what they have said So, here is a place where they went on to explain, 500 crores we have got, fair value of the item is 800 crores, the liability excluding deferred cash and cash equivalents being 200. So, they are bringing out one more fair value, fair value of the gross assets acquired being 1100. Now, in the this is a new input, in the above scenario, Substantially, all fair value of gross asset is concentrated in single identifiable asset that being building. Hence, it should be taken up as an asset acquisition, 1000, where from we are getting 1000, this being the 1000. Thousand divided by 1100, this 1100 is a new piece of information. That being 91 percentage of the value of gross asset is concentrated into single identifiable asset that being building. You have not bought business, you have bought only building. A judgment is required to conclude on the word substantially as the same is not defined in the standard. So, therefore, it is subjective. In our view, we have considered 91 percentage of the value as substantial to conclude that the above transaction is an asset acquisition and not business acquisition. So, we will discuss this in more elaboration in the next class. Today, we have just done 23, 37, 
33, 10 and we started with 103. Tomorrow we will be taking up on to 103 to a very great extent. Book backs, very important problems we will be solving. We will be taking up a little bit of consolidation also. Tomorrow it is going to be more of business combination and consolidation. Okay. So come prepared for tomorrow's class. We will be meeting by 2 o'clock. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So in case of any doubts, I shall share it back to you. Okay. And uh, also the feedback uh, soon. And uh, once again, sir, thank you for uh, taking this session. And uh, hopefully, uh, in, we also have a session tomorrow. And uh, see you there, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, once again, I'm very sorry for the technical glitch today. Hey, no problem. Tomorrow we'll be just uh, doing it. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.